The History of the Rajputs The Rajput warrior community of the northern Indian subcontinent has played a significant role in the region's history for more than a thousand years. While many kingdoms, confederations, and empires rose and fell, large extended families or clans of Rajput warriors adapted, survived, and persisted. They were often pivotal in restoring order from chaos and preserving their people and culture in the wake of destruction. Part 1. Origins The origin of these illustrious warriors is a matter of intense scholarly debate. What is broadly agreed upon is that the Rajputs emerged as a social, political, and military force sometime after the collapse of the Gupta Empire. The prominent theories on the origins of the Rajput community can be broken down into four broad categories. 1. They were descended from members of the Kshatriya warrior class of the Gupta Empire that had survived the collapse and later established their own smaller kingdoms. 2. They were descended from foreign invaders who assimilated into Hindu society. 3. They were descended from members of higher or lower castes that in turbulent times armed themselves, dedicated their lives to excellence in warfare, and refused to be victims of the times. 4. Any combination of two or all of the above theories. The Gupta Empire oversaw a golden age in Indian history. Great achievements were made in the realms of science, mathematics, astronomy, medicine, literature, art, and architecture. Wealth poured into India with long-distance trade routes that reached as far as Rome and China. All good things in this world come to an end, and so did the glory days of the Gupta. Internal power struggles and religious strife was followed by a cavalcade of nomadic invaders. Towns, cities, and temples were razed to the ground. International trade was severed. The economy collapsed. And then, there was only war for a time. The largest and most powerful group of invaders was the nomadic Huna people, which included the Kitarites and Alkan Huns. They were related to some extent to the Huns of Attila who ransacked Europe, and the Hephthalites that ravaged the Sassanid Persian Empire. The Alkan Huns conquered large swaths of the northern Indian subcontinent, while the Gupta Empire fragmented into pieces. The Huns established a powerful kingdom in the northern Indian subcontinent that lasted for a few decades. There, they minted coins and began worshipping Hindu deities like Lakshmi, Vishnu, and Shiva. They also stopped destroying temples and started building them instead, but they ultimately failed at solidifying their control in the region. After being individually beaten time and again, a large coalition of small kingdoms, along with a surviving remnant of the Gupta Empire, decisively defeated the Huna. The most powerful king in that victorious coalition, Yashad Harman, conquered his former allies and briefly united the northern Indian subcontinent. Before he died, and it all fell apart again. The defeated Huns retreated to the periphery of the subcontinent, in the west and in the north. There, they established bases of operations from where they raided and invaded from. For more than a century, they remained a constant destabilizing factor. In the early 7th century, the Indian king, Harshavardhana, established a powerful empire, and even sent an embassy that reached the imperial Tang Chinese court. But by the time the Chinese reciprocated, and a Tang ambassador reached India, Harsha's empire had already collapsed. The chaotic times continued for the remainder of the 7th century and into the 8th. It was this remarkably turbulent period in Indian history, beginning in the 6th century, that multiple extraordinary events occurred. One was the development of a game called Chaturanga, where miniature pieces representing infantry, cavalry, chariots, and elephants battled on a checkered board in a simulation of the never-ending wars of that time. This game slowly migrated westwards, gaining in popularity, eventually evolving into the game of chess, which millions of people around the world play today. Another remarkable development that emerged from the fires of that age were the small armed familial groups that survived, grew, and thrived. By the establishment of the Gujara Pratihara dynastic rule over much of the northern Indian subcontinent, the vast majority of the empire's vassal states were composed of large powerful warrior clans that had grown from the small family groups that had overcome India's centuries of troubled times. Members of these emergent clans became known as the Rajputs during the reign of the Pratiharas. Like the Rajputs, the Pratiharas' origins are also shrouded in mystery. And just like the Rajputs, there are a variety of loosely attenuated theories tying the Pratiharas to indigenous Kshatriya clans 
previous non-warrior groups or foreigners like the Alcon Huns. Both the Rajputs and the Pratiharas appear in the historical record not long after the Alcon Huns were expelled from the region. Both had highly militant social structures, with a greater emphasis on cavalry than previous Indian warriors. A foreign origin could explain these capable warriors' sudden rise to prominence, be it the Alcon Huns or an amalgamation of previous foreign warrior groups who had assimilated in the region, like the Greeks, Sakas, Kushans, and Sasanians. However, overall there is little conclusive evidence to support a predominantly foreign origin, which was the dominant academic theory in the past. Modern historical scholars tend to favor indigenous origin theories for both the Pratiharas and the Rajputs. In addition to different social classes among the settled population being inducted as new Kshatriya warriors, obscure pastoralist tribes living on the periphery of the Thar Desert, moving in to fill the power vacuum left in the wake of the Huns' destruction, has been proposed as a theory, and could explain the emergence of the Rajputs and Pratiharas. Some have also proposed that these two groups were the same, or related. Whether or not they were related, it was under the Gujara Pratiharas that the Rajputs rose to prominence. During a prosperous 9th century of expansion, the Pratihara Empire found itself surrounded by four hostile, expansionist, and capable foes. The Raj Trakutas in the south, the Pala Empire in the east, Arab states in the west, and nomadic Turkic tribes in the north. At the beginning of the 10th century, in 916, the Raj Trakutas sacked the Pratihara's capital city, Despite this disaster, the Pratiharas were able to retake their capital and successfully prevent the bulk of their territory from being annexed by any of their adversaries. However, in defeating external threats, the Pratiharas failed to maintain internal unity. Central authority eroded, as local, predominantly Rajput rulers took the lead in defending their land from the enemies that most threatened their particular region. One by one, the Pratihara's vassals ceased to recognize their rule, which was out of touch with their subjects' own rational self-interest. The Pratiharas were unable to subdue their rebellious vassals. Rather than abruptly collapse, their empire was disassembled piece by piece, until they were little more than a city-state. Beginning in the mid-10th century, the northern Indian subcontinent was dominated by a host of Rajput clans that had just become fully independent. Part 2 Age of the Rajputs Rajputana, land of the Rajputs, is the historical region that roughly corresponds to the modern Indian state of Rajasthan. Before and after the reign of the Pratiharas, it was from this region that the Rajputs slowly extended their influence and control into the salt marshes of Kutch, Gujarat, the central Indian highlands, and large parts of the Indo-Gangetic plain which was, and still is, one of the most densely populated regions in the world. Just for reference, this region is similar in size to Britain, France, Germany, Poland, Austria, Hungary, and Ireland combined. As demonstrated by the centuries of history following the collapse of the Gupta Empire, this very large and populous region was extremely difficult to manage and keep any semblance of unity. The Rajput solution to this persistent and troublesome problem was to not even try. On the local level, Rajput rulers were generally hands-off and did not attempt to micromanage the economic or political life of its subjects from the top down. Law was also on the local level, which was typically adjudicated based on the customs of individual communities. On the macro level, Rajput states were very decentralized, with little administration. In medieval India, there were around 30 to 40 prominent Rajput clans, in addition to this, there were many largely autonomous subdivisions within each clan, which over time could become its own de facto independent clan. At the head of a Rajput state, a sovereign's power was structured differently depending on the clan or region. Many clans were ruled by a hereditary monarchy, while in other clans, the monarch chose his successor or ruled alongside a council of elders. As was the case with a few Rajput states, there was no monarch. Instead, the elders of the clan voted on political issues in a type of republic called the Ghana. At the core of Rajput clan social structure was a hereditary political status based on a system of land grants. A ruler would grant large tracts of land to his closest followers, who in turn granted land to their followers, and so on. In return, 
regular military or financial payment was made to the grantor of the land. The money raised in this system was usually spent on building temples, palaces, and forts. Because this system was so simple and required so little administration, it freed up the Rajputs to focus on what they did best, which was to wage war. As members of the Hindu Kshatriya warrior class, Rajputs trained in the use of all manner of weapons from a young age. It was also not uncommon for Rajput women to train in the martial arts and weaponry. In some rare instances, a few women joined in the fighting, usually in a crisis situation when all hope was lost. In one example, a Rajput queen led her deceased husband's ill-fated army into battle atop an elephant. An extreme but more common response to impending defeat in battle was for Rajput women to self-immolate rather than face the dishonor of being captured by enemy soldiers. In peacetime, women's more typical pursuits would be in the realms of embroidery, literature, painting, and music. In comparison to many other cultures of medieval to early modern times, Rajput women frequently were literate, and in addition to men wrote many stories, songs, and poems. These were usually romantic, adventurous tales, where the honor, courage, and bravery of their clansmen were celebrated. Over time, the Rajputs became increasingly obsessive about their honor. Duels to defend one's honor were extremely common, and warfare between Rajput clans became a highly ritualized affair. In one example, a Rajput Raja had food delivered to a fortress he was besieging because he believed it would be dishonorable to starve them out or to fight them when the defenders were not at full strength. The besieged defenders eventually lost. In another example of perhaps taking the concept of honor to a self-destructive level, one Rajput Raja fought a gratuitous series of duels where he slaughtered all of his own best warriors. This left his kingdom greatly weakened, which allowed a rival to easily annex his territory. In the centuries of Rajput prominence, Wars were constantly being fought, and borders frequently shifted, disappeared, and were redrawn. In history, it is highly unusual for a seemingly fractured, disjointed society, frequently at war with itself and everyone else, to have a thriving economy. And the medieval Rajput economy was one of those rare instances. This was due in large part to the Rajput's highly ritualized, honor-based system of warfare. Rajput armies dueled against each other, with the winner getting to collect the taxes of the region they were fighting over. Consequently, both sides typically try not to disrupt the economy of the territory they were fighting over, because collecting the revenue was the end goal. In addition to the land tax, which was the basis of the Rajput economy, a tax on merchants bringing goods into or out of a Rajput clan's territory became another lucrative source of income. Despite the frequent conflict, the Rajputs gained a reputation for guaranteeing the safety of merchants. Arab merchants from the Sindh and beyond frequented the ports of the Gujarat. From there, they exported large quantities of spices, perfumes, diamonds, emeralds, sapphires, cotton and silk fabrics, and metals. The Rajputs were also expert horse breeders. They exported some of the small agile horses they had in abundance, while importing larger war horses. Because of their shared economic interests, the Rajputs and the Arab Emirates of the Sindh had increasingly amicable relations. In the early 11th century, a new power arrived in the Indian subcontinent, the Ghaznavids. They were Turkic slave soldiers who had freed themselves and created their own empire. The Rajputs, in particular Boja of Malwa, was able to halt Ghaznavid expansion. For the next century, the Ghaznavids were content to raid the south while the Rajputs held off their expansion while fighting among themselves. In the late 12th century, the Gurids, a Ghaznavid vassal, overthrew their rule, and then expanded into the Indian subcontinent. Part 3. Age of Empires Realizing the threat that the new more formidable Gurid Empire presented, the Rajputs organized a confederation of mutual defense. In 1191, the Rajput coalition decisively defeated the Gurds, wounding the Sultan, who barely escaped with his life. The following year, Muhammad of Gore returned with a massive army of 120,000 men. This included a large cavalry contingent of horse archers, whose hit-and-run feigned retreat tactics the Rajputs were unfamiliar with. This time, the Rajputs were decisively defeated, and the Gurds capitalized on the victory and rapidly expanded their territory to the east. Muhammad was assassinated a few years later, and his empire split after his death. One of his generals established a sultanate in the strategically located city of Delhi, 
For the next 320 years, the Delhi Sultanate was engaged in a near continual struggle to fully subdue the Rajputs. During the reign of Alauddin Khalji, a Mongol invasion was repulsed, and then Alauddin invaded Rajputana. There, the Rajput Maharaja Ratna Simha fought Alauddin during the siege of Chittor for eight months before the Sultan's forces were able to storm the fortress. The Rajputs were cut down to the last man, while their wives self immolated. Alauddin continued to conquer most of the Indian subcontinent. After his death, his successors continued to expand the Sultanate's territory for a few more years. Then, a civil war, Rajput rebellion, and an invasion by the Turko-Mongol warlord Tamerlane sent the Sultanate into terminal decline. For the next century, the resurgent Rajput confederacy successfully battled the Delhi Sultanate, becoming the strongest power in the Indian subcontinent. Then, another group of mixed Turkic and Mongol ancestry, the Mughals, arrived. After the Mughals conquered Delhi, they came into contact with the Rajputs. Initially, the Rajput Confederacy held off the Mughal advance under the leadership of Rana Sangha. During the reign of Akbar, the Mughals conquered Rajputana and then all of the northern Indian subcontinent. During this process, many Rajputs fought to the last man, while their wives committed Jauhar. After battling the Mughals, other Rajput leaders sought to ensure the survival of their people, and when offered peace on favorable terms, including marriage alliances, it was accepted. As the Muslim Mughal Empire expanded, many of its top generals were Hindu Rajputs. Some Rajputs were even appointed subadars, governors, who ruled regions on behalf of the emperor. The Mughal Empire reached the height of its territorial expansion during the reign of Aurangzeb. It was also during his reign that an increasing amount of discrimination against the majority Hindu population of the empire became public policy. Consequently, many previously loyal Rajputs rebelled. They made an alliance with the anti-Mughal Maratha Confederacy based out of the Deccan Plateau. While the Marathas and Rajputs were defeating the Mughals, a criminally capitalist corporate cabal captured Bengal. The British East India Company's private army of perfidious pilfering profiteers pillaged their path into war with the Maratha Confederacy and sought to place their own princely Peshwa puppet on its throne. They proceeded to fight three wars against each other. In the third conflict, the British East India Company exploited hostile relations between the Marathas and the weakened Rajput states. They convinced the Rajput states to not get involved and to accept the Britishers as the premier power after the war with the Marathas was over. In exchange, they promised the Rajputs protection and autonomy. Afterwards, under the company and British rule, Rajput authority was slowly eroded, though they did exercise a greater deal of autonomy compared to most other regions in India. Following Indian independence, the 22 Rajput princely states chose to join the new country. They formed the state of Rajasthan, which today has a population of more than 78 million people. Rajputs continue to be an important part of Indian society as they have been since after the fall of the Gupta Empire. This has been Epimetheus. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I hope I pronounced things right. If you're a Rajput or from India, I would love to read in the comments of what do you believe is uh, the most interesting or unique thing of Rajput society and culture today, or just a fun fact. Or if you are just learning about the Rajputs, what do you find interesting about Rajput history? And a tremendous thanks to my patrons who help make videos like this possible.